Previously, we have looked at the German super heavy tank known as the E100. In that video, I briefly mentioned a version of the vehicle intended to carry a much larger gun. Due to its inclusion in the game World of Tanks and a variety of models since, the Jagdpanzer E100 has become a widely recognized vehicle in the community. Today, we will look into more detail on the true history behind this tank destroyer. I think the best place to start in our examination of this vehicle logically should be its name. Although it may seem correct to refer to the E100 base design as a Jagdpanzer, this is not quite the case. The term itself translates to essentially just mean tank destroyer, which does match the vehicle's role in World of Tanks, so where does the issue with the designation come in? To fully understand this, we need to consider what the German army used the Panzerjäger or Jagdpanzer label for. The first example of a Panzerjäger was found relatively early in the war with the aptly named Panzerjäger I on the Panzer I chassis. Later vehicles like these, such as the Jagdpanzer IV on the Panzer IV hull, at first seem to have a different designation, but the term Panzerjäger and Jagdpanzer mean the same thing and are used interchangeably when referring to vehicles. This all seems straightforward until we add in the term Sturmgeschütz, which translates to assault gun. On the surface, this may not seem much different than the tank destroyer designation, but it had a big impact on how these vehicles were used. To put it simply, and without some additional nuance, the Sturmgeschütz, like the Stug 3, were not primarily used as tank destroyers, rather engaging a variety of targets. Jagdpanzers, on the other hand, were intended to be more specifically anti-tank oriented. This topic by itself could probably make an entire video because even in the example I gave of the Jagdpanzer IV or the later Jagdpanther, the Sturmgeschütz term routinely pops up in reference to the vehicles. So what does all this mean in regards to the Jagdpanzer E100? Well, considering the fact that unlike some of the more dedicated anti-tank vehicles, the planned armament of a 17cm cannon was much more capable of being used in a supporting role with its more powerful gun and ammunition compared to the weaker 75mm cannons on some of the earlier Jagdpanzers. When we consider both this and the fact that a similar proposal for the mouse was designated as Sturmgeschütz, it seems more likely that an E100 based design would have received that designation. To simplify all of what I just said in case I confused any of you, the term Jagdpanzer would most likely not have been given to this particular vehicle as its role would not have been solely anti-tank. Really, it all boils down to which group ended up with the vehicle if it had been completed. For this reason, the more historically accurate name is something along the lines of Sturmgeschütz auf E100 Fahrgestell or at least Sturmgeschütz E100. With the name out of the way, we can now consider the fake vehicle itself, followed by the shreds of reality it is built on. Considering the most famous of these is without a doubt Wargaming's interpretation, we will start there. In-game, the description given to the vehicle is as follows. The E100 was conceived as the basis for a self-propelled gun, an anti-aircraft vehicle, and a tank destroyer. However, development was never started. As for the vehicle itself, it features a rear-mounted superstructure with 200mm of frontal armor, which houses a massive 17cm main armament. It also has another weapon shown here on the roof. This may be a 30mm gun, as was proposed for the similar vehicle based on the mouse hull to act as an anti-air gun. Unfortunately, it does not seem to be specified what this is anywhere, so I'm just guessing. To power this beast, it is equipped with a 1,200 horsepower engine named the Maybach Nues Project, mounted in the middle of the hull. So how does this stack up to the real-world equivalent? To call the Jagdpanzer E100 a completely fake tank is a bit disingenuous, since there is some evidence to support that at least the concept was real. However, the way it has been widely portrayed is unrealistic for a few reasons. The historical origin of this concept seems to trace back to mid-1944 with it being proposed to use either the E100 hull or mouse hull as a platform to mount a 15cm or 17cm weapon in a casemate. Although it could be argued the mouse was the more logical of the two for this given the fact that it was further along in production than the E100 with quite a few hulls already partially completed compared to the single E100 hull, the mouse hulls and added superstructure had an issue. 
Due to the height of the mouse hull, the added superstructure was found to be too tall for transporting via rail compared to the shorter E100. With this, the E100 project would continue for a short time before being cancelled with at least one scale model reportedly being completed. Unfortunately, almost all documents related to this design have either been lost, destroyed, or have yet to be rediscovered, meaning we know very little about the actual layout of the vehicle. The only drawing which remains showcases a proposed mounting method for the 15cm weapon onto the E100. That being said, we can still make some educated assumptions about how this vehicle may have looked. The main question regarding the vehicle is whether or not it would have had a rear-mounted superstructure or one mounted in the center. Unfortunately, as Germany used a variety of different layouts, including both these options on other designs, there wasn't a clear preference for one layout, meaning it could theoretically be either. What we really have to consider is the chassis being used, that obviously being the E100. When we consider that the turret for the vehicle was planned to be mounted in the center and the engine behind it, this lends some credibility to the idea that a superstructure would logically do the same like that we see on the Jagdtiger. This would also make sense if a later layout of the E100 which featured both a rear engine and rear transmission were to be used for the assault gun design. Although as we see with the Ferdinand, it is not impossible to move the engine in a vehicle to a different location, this is not a simple process and would require additional work to complete. That being said, it could be done if the original layout was used, although it would make little to no sense to do so if the entire power pack was located in the rear. For these reasons, I tend to believe the centrally mounted superstructure is a much more logical positioning for this particular vehicle. The closest comparison to the E100 is the previously mentioned Jagdtiger, which had a similar layout to the heavy tank. Something a bit more clear is which of the two guns would be the most likely to be mounted into this vehicle. Unlike the one shown in World of Tanks, it seems that the 15cm was the primary candidate, considering that the 17cm itself was still relegated to the drawing board at that point. When we also consider the larger ammunition and other increased requirements for using a larger weapon, the 15cm was realistically more than enough. Similarly, the engine described in World of Tanks does not seem to be real, although the HL234 when supercharged would have achieved roughly the same horsepower output. The only truth we can be certain of about this vehicle is that we will probably never know the full story behind it. We can go around in circles talking about might-haves and could-bes, but if the original plans for this short-lived project were truly destroyed, we can only guess. Unlike many of the other vehicles we have discussed in Fake Tank Friday, this one truly sits on a knife's edge of whether it can really be called a fake or if it is something more in the Cursed by Design category. It certainly has features of both, and the only reason I put it in this series was because the main portrayal of it is the product of guesswork. So although we can confidently say that Wargaming's Jagdpanzer E100 is a fake, it does draw from a real project which saw a discussion. At the very least, it does provide us an opportunity to put ourselves into the heads of tank designers to consider what they may have done and the reasons why. If you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend following it with my video covering the E100 itself because it has by far one of the most unique developments of all German vehicles, and you can learn about how it may actually still exist today somewhere. Thanks as always for liking and subscribing, and to all my YouTube members who support my content. As you may have seen from some of my latest community posts, I've recently cut ties with one of my previous sponsors, which included an ad which would have gone up on my last video. So having the additional support from some of you really helps keep the channel going when things happen which cause a short-term loss of income, even if the cause is largely my own fault. Anyways, check out the E100 video like I mentioned, or one of my others if you've already seen it. I'll see you all in the next video you choose.